Hello everyone, how are you? Good afternoon. Okay, so let me share my screen first. Is my screen visible? Jesus. Yes, okay. So we will start in less than a minute now. So, okay, hello once again, and let us, let us start. Okay, so we started talking about CFL. So any questions before we begin? Anything from last time? Okay, last time I did not say that languages cannot be ambiguous. I said that there are some languages which are ambiguous and we can sometimes remove the ambiguity. First of all, we need to figure out if there is an ambiguity and if there is, we can sometimes remove it. And there are some languages which are uh, inherently ambiguous. That is no matter what kind of grammar you decide, design, uh, they will always be ambiguous. So I did not say that. Anyway, so let us start uh, uh, by repeating few things that we did last time and then we will continue. So I would write uh, the definition of a CFG once again. So we say that a CFG is a four tuple and uh, a CFG is a four tuple. And what are the four things that are in this um, sequence of tuple? V, sigma, R and S, where V is the set of variables. That's P finite. a set of alphabet. Again, it has to be finite. Okay. <clears throat> and not only that, V and sigma are disjoint, right? This has to be the case. Okay, uh, what else we have R. R are the rules. They're also called productions. It's a set of rules and set of productions. And S is the spot. Okay, I might be mistaken. So this is our definition of a context grammar. Then we looked at a couple of examples and we saw that how these examples look and then we looked at the derivation and we looked at uh, other things, right? So let us continue with that.
Okay. So, so the question arises that if I give you a language, suppose, suppose L is a language. And I ask you to design a, a context free grammar. How would you define it? So we do not know what this L is, but this L could be anything, right? And if I ask you that, suppose this language is defined somehow, uh, can you tell me what is the context for grammar? Suppose in, in, in particular, let's assume that L is a grammar, L is a language that consists of, uh, so sigma, suppose sigma is zero one, and L is, is a language of all zeros and ones such that there are N zeros and N ones, all the zeros before all the ones, and this n is greater than equal to zero. Right? It means that l consists of empty string 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, and so on. If I ask you to design a context free grammar for this, can you do that? Can anyone try? What would be the context free grammar for this language? So we already know sigma is zero one, right? So what we need to know is find out this V, R and S. Can you do that? Anyone? Sir, we can go by saying like variable s goes to zero s one and variable s goes to epsilon. Okay, so okay. that that's correct. That's actually the answer to this uh, question. But uh, but let's try to think about from the point of view that suppose uh, you get a new language and you need to design a grammar for that. Then how or what should you look at? For example, this is a very simple language in which we know the structure of a string is very, very simple. That is, it has all zeros before all ones and that's the number of zeros exactly number of ones. So, so you need rules which should be, we should cater this empty string. So there must be a rule which allow us to uh, generate or drive this empty string. And then every other string that that, uh, that is generated by the grammar must have the same number of zeros and one, right? So there is a symmetry, right? So we can say, imagine there is a variable S and this variable is S is in such a way that whatever this variable is, you can replace it with epsilon. So this epsilon will give you the first string, okay? Or you can say that we can add one more rule that whenever we have this S, we can always replace this S with zero and one, right? But this is a constant language, right? So it, it only drives two possible strings. This is not infinite, this is finite. So we need some kind of recursion. So let's say we insert S over here. So this S is the same variable that we have <clears throat> on the left-hand side. So it says that we can replace this S by zero S. That is a string can grow from the middle. So every time we apply this production, uh, there is an addition of zero and one on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of this S, right? So this, this string, so every string uh, which contain any number of zeros and equal number of ones such that all zeros are before ones would be, we would be able to drive that string from this grammar or that a string can be generated from. So this is a very simple language. In this particular case, we, if you want, we can write them together. We can say that S is a, is a rule. S is a variable such that there's a rule. There's one, there are two rules that S substitutes zero one S or it substitutes epsilon, epsilon for the end. So this is our R. Okay. V is just uh, S and that's it. That's it. That is our gamma. Okay. Now, uh, if I say this- Sir, is it zero one S or zero S one? As you have written above. Yeah, I made a mistake here. Thank you. Zero S one. Now suppose I say there's another language. So let's call this language L1 and let's call another language L2. And this L2 is very similar to the language L1, except that it has one and zero n. 
rather than zero n. So can you tell me what should be uh, the rules for that? R2 must be. We can say that we can utilize the symmetry and it's zero, right? Exactly, because it is very symmetrical. We know a, a solution for the for the previous language, so we know the solution. So, so the question is uh, how to design um, uh, context-free grammars in general. Right? So, the this, the answer is there is no general algorithm. There is no general algorithm or simple uh, procedure which, if you follow, then you will get the grammar. Unlike the regular languages in which we have uh, a regular expression, and then from regular expression, we can convert it into an NFA with empty transition and, and so on. So there is no way that you start with a language and you convert that language into uh, a CFG. So there is no direct way, there is no direct algorithm. There are some tricks uh, that we can utilize, um, but these are only tricks, right? And they work sometimes, but they do not work in some cases. So. So there's, there's a trick and that one trick is that, for example, if we have, uh, uh, let's suppose we have two languages, L1 and L2, okay? And for L1, we have found a grammar G1 and we have found a grammar G2. So there's a language L1, there's a language L2. We have a grammar for L1 and we have a grammar for G2. Now, suppose we describe another language L, which is the L1 union L2. That it is, it is the union of the two languages that we define. Then the grammar for the union of these languages is basically the union of the grammars. Okay, so we can combine different grammars together. How can we do that? Uh, we can do that by we know that this this grammar G one must have uh, sigma v r and s. This must also have sigma v r and s. Right. So it's sigma could differ, differ, this V could differ, this R could differ, this S could differ, right? So I will explain it within, with the help of one simple example, and then I will describe a general algorithm for that. So suppose we have a language L that consists of the L1 union L2. And this L1 is exactly the language that we defined in the previous page. And L2 is also the language that we defined in the previous page. That is, this is this language L is a union of zero n, one n, for n greater than or equal to zero, union one n, zero n, for n greater than or equal to zero. Yes, so this is a new language. So we do not know how to define a context-free grammar for this, but we know a context-free grammar that generates this language, as well as a context-free grammar that generates this language. So in order to create a context-free grammar for this L, what we need to do? We need to just combine the grammars for them. Okay. So what was the grammar for L1? So the grammar for L1 was S01S S okay. and what was the grammar for L2? S1S0. S this is for L2. Right? Now, since these variables are the same, so we need to make sure that when one, because these two variables define or substitute different rules. So let's just rename them. So let's call it S1, let's call it S2, okay? Now we can say that the union of the languages, which was L1 and L2, which is L, we can define a grammar G for this. And this grammar would be a grammar that contains a symbol S, such that the symbol will substitute S1. So this is the S1 from here or S2. This is the S2 coming from here. And S1 is exactly as 0, S1, 1, epsilon. And S2 is 1, S2, 0, epsilon. This is the grammar. This, these are the rules. These uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 rules are the rules that generate this language. Is this in clear? Is this in clear? Okay. I'm sorry. Yes. So is it necessary to put an S uh, extra uh, variable that you put like S? Can we just yes. start with S1 instead? No, we cannot. We have to do that. 
So I, I will give you a general procedure. Suppose there is, um, uh, let's say there are K CFGs. Okay. There are K CFGs. And, and these K CFGs describe a language L1 and two LK. We do not know what are those languages. Suppose these are the languages. And suppose these K CFGs have S1, S2, SK as a start symbol, a start variable in each of their respective grammars. Okay. So we have uh, G1, for L1 we have G1, for L2 we have G2, and for everything like GK for the LK. So we have, L, uh, we have K languages and we have K grammars. And for each grammar, we have a corresponding SI as the start variable, right? Now we define a new language L, which is the union of L1, L2, up to LK, right? It is the union of every language. Right? So we have a new language, which is the union of all of these. So how to define the CFG for this one? So the CFG is very simple in this case. What we would do, we would say that, okay, first of all, we need to make sure that the variable names do not overlap. If they do, if they do overlap, for example, there's a variable here, uh, which is A in, in one of the CFGs, and the same variable A is used in another CFG. So make sure that you rename all those variables so there is no common variable name because these grammars are a different are different grammars. So we just rename all the variables. Okay. So once we do that renaming, what we need to do, we need to create a new variable S. Okay. So this is a new variable which is not present in any of the grammars. And we would create a new rule which is S1 or S2 or all the way till S K. So all the start variables all of all the grammars will become the substitution rule, the new substitution rules for this grammar for G. Okay, this grammar G is the grammar uh, for LK, uh, for, for the union of all languages, right? And that's it. And then together with this rule and all the rules of all the languages will, be, will become the grammar for the, for the union of all these uh, grammars. And that, that's exactly what we did in this particular case. So there was this variable S1 here, and there was a bit, so first of all, there were two variables in both the cases, they were S, right? So we renamed those variables in such a way that they do not overlap. Then we created a new variable S, which creates, uh, and, and we created two rules. This S, this S substitutes S1, S1 for the uh, for start variable of the language L1, and S2 uh, for the start variable of the language L2, right? And then we wrote down all the rules of S1, uh, all the rules of L1 and all the rules of uh, L2. And this whole thing is a new grammar. So this is exactly what we would do. Then we would write all the rules, all rules of G1, all rules of G2, all rules of GK. So we would write down all the rules together with this new rule and we are done and that's it. Is this in clear? Any question for that? Now, why it is important? Uh, it is important in the sense that sometimes you receive languages which are not necessarily explicitly mentioned at union of two languages. Uh, but you can do a little computation and find out that, okay, there is a pattern inside the language and you can break down as, as the union of two languages. And it is easier to build a CFG for one of them uh, and all of them separately so that we can find the union. Yes, we just need to list down all the rules together as we did here. Okay. Okay, so uh, when we started talking about CFG, I said that regular languages are a subset of context-free language, right? There are other languages which are not context-free and we will talk about them uh, when time comes. But we know that regular languages is completely, the set of regular languages completely contained within CFL, right? So the set of regular languages is completely contained within the set of context-free languages, right? 
So what is meant by completely contained? The meaning of completely contained means that everything that is a regular is also a CFL, but not vice versa, right? So we can say that this set of regular languages is a proper subset of the set of context-free languages. So remember this sign is the proper subset, right? And this sign is the improper subset. In LaTeX, we write it like uh, the C is subset. This one is subset equal, right? So, so RL is a proper subset of CFL. And we know that for every CFL, we can find uh, a, a context-free grammar, right? And, and we will prove it later on as well. Uh, but by definition, every regular language is also a context-free language, right? Now, suppose I give you a language L and I tell you that L is a regular language, okay? Can you construct, can you design a context-free grammar for this L? It's very simple. So first of all, let us create a language L and this language L is uh, zero plus one star zero one. Can you can you give me a DFA which uh, recognizes this language? Yes, anyone can try. So zero one is self loop, then But this is NFA, right? Not DFA. Can you convert this NFA into DFA? Uh, star operation, say. Yes. Is this DFA the DFA that accepts this language or not? It's, can anyone tell me this is correct or incorrect? <clears throat> okay, how would you check this? This is correct or incorrect? By using test cases. Oh, yes, of course. So what the test cases you would uh, like to, to run? So we know that every string that this uh, DFA recognized should end with zero one, right? And the first part could be empty because there's a star over there. So let's check if zero one is accepted. So we start with the starting, uh, the, the initial state of the starting state. 
And so let's say zero one is a string. So one, uh, when the machine reads zero, it goes to the new state. And then machine reads one, it goes to the final state and that's it. So it ends in this state, which is accepting state to so zero one is accepted, right? Okay. Is empty string accepted? Is, is empty string in, in the language L? No. Is empty string accepted by this automata? No. Uh, is zero in L? No. Is one in L? No. So are, are these uh, strings accepted by this language or by this DFA? No. So let's figure out that what are other strings which we think that should not be accepted. So we know that one, one, one is not in the language, right? Okay, one, one, one is not in the language. Is this uh, string accepted by this DFA? No. Okay. Can you think of a string which is accepted by this DFA, which is not in the language? Or the other way, think of a string that is in the language, but not accepted by the state. <clears throat> so the argument that you would be coming up with now is not a formal argument. So when we say that it's not a formal argument, that it, it, it means that uh, whatever we say right now uh, is basically uh, not a proof that what we are saying is completely true. It's just an intuitive, informal way to check whether our uh, DFA is, is correct or incorrect. It is almost same as checking whether the program that you've written in any programming language is correct or incorrect, right? So when you write a program, how do you check that your program is correct? You run test cases. So how many test cases you run? Maybe one, two, five, 10, maybe 15, that's it. And then you try to figure out some uh, corner cases, some boundary cases, uh, for example, if the input is 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 empty or input input is something like this, and and what happens? So if, if you are dealing with numbers, what happens if the number is zero? What happens with an, when the number is negative? What happens when it is positive? What happens when it is too big or too small? And things like that, right? So these are the ways we check whether a program is correct for a particular input or not. Uh, but since we know that it is impossible to check each and every test case, so we cannot be sure that our program is completely correct even for the unknown cases, right? So the same argument is coming up, up here that we would test some strings and we will, and, and, and these test cases will improve our confidence that what we have written down, what we have designed is, is a correct solution. But it will not be a proof. It will not be a complete mathematical proof that what we have done is completely correct, right? Uh, but in, 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 in programs, we have another alternative which we call formal program verification. And we can follow a certain mathematical procedure uh, to be sure about whether the output of the function is exactly what we decide. So over here, we can do something similar. And that is we can use some mathematical induction or some other proof techniques to show that whatever we have drawn is, is the correct DFA, right? But we are not going in that detail, mathematical detail. So we would just test uh, some uh, strings which are in the language and see that if they're accepted, and some strings which are not in the language and see if they are not accepted. Okay. So we will see some count uh, corner cases, for example, the smallest string or maybe a big string and the strings which are there and which are not there, right? So it seems like a correct idea. Uh, anyone who thinks that this is not correct. Okay, so suppose we have a language L and this language is regular. Okay. We can construct a CSG for L. Okay. And how do we do that? So the first step is design a DFA. Right? And, and we know that we can design a DFA for L because L is regular, so we can construct a design DFA. Not NFA, not NFA with empty transitions, but a DFA, a, a deterministic finite automata for L. So you can start with constructing uh, a non-deterministic finite automata, and then you can convert it into a DFA and then simplify. And once you have a DFA, you can start your procedure. Okay? So, if we have a DFA, let's suppose this M is a DFA, uh, which is for L, 
there is uh, the language of M is the language L, right? <clears throat> so M must be five tuple, right? So what is the M? M is uh, Q sigma delta Q zero in M, right? So we know that set of states, the alphabet, the transition function, the uh, starting state, initial state, and the set of exception states. Right, so we have a DFA. So now what we would do, so we know that Q is the set of states and there could be one state, there could be two states or there could be multiple states. So we do not know how many states in, in this machine are. But whatever is the number of state for each state, for each state, QI in Q, make a variable right for each state qi in q make a variable r okay so this is the step number 1 step number 2 add rule so we need to add rules what are those rules so we say that ri this ri substitutes a r j R I will substitute A R J. What is A? A is some symbol from the alphabet. Whenever, whenever the transition function in the DFA at Q I at A gives you Q J. So if there is a transition Q I, if there is a state Q I in your DFA such that when the machine reads A, it goes to state Q J, then add this rule. That's it. For every transition in DFA, we will add this rule. Okay. And we will make R0 as the start variable. What is R0? R0 corresponds to Q0. Right? Is this in clear? So let's do an example. So the example was this DFA here. This is the this is exactly the same DFA that we constructed in last example, right? Uh, there is one transition missing. So what happens when it is here? It is here. So let's give them names. So let's call it Q0, Q1, Q2. So how many variables we will have in our, so sigma is uh, 0, 1. So sigma will be 0, 1 in our grammar as well. What will be uh, the set of rules? First of all, let's see what is the variables. They will be R0, R1, and R2. Right. R0 corresponds to Q0, R1 corresponds to Q1, and R2 corresponds to Q2. So let's start with Q0. So Q0 means R0. There must be a rule which states that when you take one Q0, it states Q0. So one R0. Right. It says that if you read zero, you can go to R1. What about R2? What about R1? 0 R1, R1, 1 R2. What about R2? 0 R1, R2, 1 R0. Okay. And what is our S? The start variable is R0. And this is our grammar. This grammar will recognize or accept exactly the same language that this DFA is accepting. Is this in clear? How did we get this grammar? We followed this algorithm.
So what is that? What is the algorithm? Algorithm contains just uh, uh, three rules, right? So rule number one. Rule number one. So when you have a DFA, for every state in this DFA, make a variable. So Q0 is a state, so we have R0. Q1 is a variable, so we have R1. Q2 is a variable, so we have R2, right? Now for every transition that we have in this DFA, we would have one rule. So how many transitions we have? We have one, we have two, three, four, five, and six. So we would have six rules. So we have exactly six rules, sorry. One, two, three, four, five, and six, right? So we have six rules. So six transitions, six rules. So for every transition, we would have one rule. And what is this rule? The rule is very simple. So it says that whenever in the DFA, the machine is in QI and it reads A, it goes to QJ. So this is a transition. Now for every such transition, we would have a rule. What is the rule? It says this, when the machine is in RI, we would have a rule which says that A, RJ. RI corresponds to QI and RJ corresponds to QJ. And this A is here. If you follow this procedure, we will end up with, with a grammar that generates exactly the same language that is des described by or accepted by this DFA. And you can, you can work with any DFA you like, right? So start with a small, simple DFA and think about a language. And then you can con convert that DFA into a, a context-free grammar and check if that context-free grammar uh, accepts or recognizes or generates the same kind of language. I hope that answered your question. Um, sir? Yes. Why can't we use this for an NFA? Why can't we use this for NFA? Okay, the reason that we cannot use this for NFA is that because in NFA, not all transitions are there, right? So some transitions are undefined because the, par because the, uh, the transition function is a partial function. So we may miss some cases. That's why it is not defined. And this algorithm requires that it has to be DFA because this DFA is a complete thing. That is all transitions are defined. So how many transitions would be there if there is a DFA of N states? Okay, so this is a very good question and it could be an exam question. Suppose there is a sigma, we do not know what is the sigma. And, but I tell you that the number of elements in the sigma is N, okay? And I have a DFA such that the number of states in these, this DFA is N, okay? So what is the number of Transitions in N. What is the total number of transitions in N? MN. Why? Because for each state, for each state, there must be M outgoing edges. And that is exactly the number of transitions. So you can see in this example, the size of the sigma is two, and there are three states. So three times two is six. There are exactly six transitions. So if it is less than six, it means that we have missed something. And if there is more than six, it means there's, it, it's not necessarily a DFA. Now, the question, I, I changed the question. Suppose there is an NFA, and this NFA is called N, capital N. And I, I ask the same question. What is the number of transition in N? M to the power n random guess. You do not know because we cannot we cannot find an upper bound. It is impossible to find the number of transitions. There could be only few transitions, there could be a lot of transitions. Right? So we cannot bind, we cannot find a number because there could be empty transitions, as many empty transitions as we want. Right? So it is. Of course, if we work out, we can find a number, but it's 
this number is useless because that number does not tell us anything about the nature of the NFA or, I mean, it tells us that how many transitions we have, but it does not tell us anything about the length. So, so the number of transition in NFA is not uh, a meaningful number, while the number of transition in DFA is a meaningful number because that number will go directly as the number of rules in our CFG. So there was, so in, in our previous example, the sigma size of sigma is two, there are three states, so three times two is six. So there are six transition and each transition corresponds to, uh, to one rule in the graph, right? So we know there's a direct one-to-one uh, -one correspondence over there. Okay. Anyway, so um, any other question? Okay, so last time I, I touched upon a concept called ambiguity. So let us explore ambiguity first. Uh, so let me write a very simple grammar that I used in last time as well, which is E. It's, it's an expression grammar, e plus e, e times e, or e within the parentheses, or just a, okay? And suppose I have a string which is a plus a star a, okay? So how can we start with, uh, with this? How can we drive, how can we generate this string from the gap. So since E is a start variable, we have to start with E. And from E, we have to go either to this rule or this rule or this rule or this rule. We cannot apply this rule because it contains three copies of A, so this cannot be applied. There is no parentheses, so we cannot apply this one. We cannot apply this one, we cannot apply this one. We can only apply this rule or this rule. Since these two rules appear and, and there is no actually uh, order of the rules because this is a set of rules, right? So this is a set. It's, and, and we know that uh, from our understanding of, of discrete mathematics and from programming as well, that there's no order among elements of a set. So it does not mean, it does not mean anything to tell, to say that this is the first rule or the second rule or the second rule or the first. All rules are there. So they are members of the set. So it doesn't mean anything to say that this is the first rule or the second rule. So we know that these, these two rules uh, do not apply because we do not have parentheses here. We do not have one A, there are three A's. So we cannot apply this last rule, the last two. We can only apply the first two rules. The rule with uh, E substituting E plus E and the, and the rule that E substitutes E times E, right? Uh, so let me call it E times. Okay, so we can apply one of these two rules. And there is no priority given to any rule. So we cannot say that apply this rule first before you apply this, this rule. So we cannot uh, impose any priority and there is no order of the rule. So we can apply any rule we like, okay? So suppose we apply this rule, which, which, which comes in this one first. So it says that E plus E, right? Now we know that this is plus sign and this plus sign corresponds to this plus here from the rule, and this plus must correspond here. So this part of this expression has to be derived by E, and this part also be driven by E. So this part corresponds to this one, and this part corresponds to this one. So we pivot around this plus, right? So we pivot around this plus. Now, alternately, if we had used the other rule, which is E substitutes to E times E, then we know that this multiplication sign will be the one that we pivot around, right? So this, this part will be E, and this part will be E, right? So the whole thing, A plus A will be the first E here, and this last A is the, is the E here, right? Are you getting it? Are you with me? Yes, Sir, please repeat this. So I'm saying that the string is a plus a times a, right? Now we can apply either this rule or this rule. So 
So we have two rules. The rule one rule says that E substitutes E plus E, and this and the other rule says that E substitutes E times E. And since there is no priority among the rules, so we can apply any rule we like, right? Because both of these can be applied. If we apply this rule, which says E plus E, then this plus will correspond to this plus in the expression, in the input. And everything that is on the left of this plus will become the first E. And everything that is on the right of plus will become the second E, right? And if we apply the second rule here, that is E times E, then this star, uh, this multiplication sign, so if I write it here again, this multiplication sign will be matched with this multiplication sign. So whatever that is on the left of this multiplication sign will become the first E, and whatever that is on the right of this multiplication sign will become the second, right? Because there is only one plus and one multiplication sign. And we already have uh, decided which one, which rule, which rule we would apply. So this means it will match one of them, like, right? Does it make sense? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Anyone who is still is confused about it? So uh, let me explain it one more time. So I have this string A plus A times A, right? Now suppose if I bring this rule E plus E, then I have to match, since plus is a terminal symbol, it's not a variable. So I have to match, so I will bring this window of E plus E to this string, okay? So I will bring this window of E plus E, and I would, so I will, I will bring this window of E plus E and see that where to match. I will match it here and we align it. So when we match it, we align it. Now, what happens is that whatever that is, so this plus is matched, and whatever that is on the left of this plus will become this E, and whatever that is on the right of this plus will become this E, right? And if we do the same thing with the other rule, that is A plus A times A, I have a rule which says E times E, then I know that I need to match it. So I, I need, when I match it, I, I cannot match it here, I cannot match it here, I cannot match it here, I have to match it here. Once I match it here, I know that this multiplication sign matches with multiplication sign, and this A will match with this E, and this A plus A will match with this. <clears throat> Do you get it now? I hope it is clear now. Okay, now, so, once we are done with it, once we are done with the first application of the substitution rule, either with this rule or this rule, okay? So either the first rule or the second rule. So when I say first and second, this is just for the convention, not to mention that there is an order, right? So either the rule that I have written on the left or the rule on the right, once we have applied, then, then we do not have any, any further choice. So let me write it this way. So I will go with the first one and then I will go with the second. So we have the same string a plus a times a. So I apply e plus e, right? So I say that e substitutes e plus e. Once I apply, I know that this e has to match this one and this e has to match this one. So this e can directly go to the last rule. So what is the last rule? This last rule says that e substitutes the same. That's perfectly fine. We know that this can match. <clears throat> This is for this one. Okay, so this one matches. Now let's talk about this plus. I'm sorry, I, I made a mistake one more. Let, let me repeat A plus A times A, and I say that E substitutes. E plus E. So this plus aligns with this one. So we, we know that this E corresponds to this one and this corresponds to this one. So this directly 
goes to E, applying the, the last rule. And this E has to go to this one, which is the application of E times E. And then this will go to E, this E will go to A, and this E will go to A. So if I write it in a tree form, then we start with E, then we apply E plus E, then this E becomes A, this E becomes E times E, and this A, E becomes A, and this E becomes A. Okay, is this thing clear? So this is a derivation. Derivation of A plus A times A. Okay, now let's see that rather than having this rule as the first one, we, we get the other rule. And that and the other rule is E, e ta, A times A. E times A. So if we go with this rule, we know that we would have E times E, right? Now, this has to be E plus E, then it has to be A, A, A. Okay, so this is again a derivation of A plus A times. Okay, so we have two different derivations. And whenever we have a case when we have two different derivations, same string, then we say that the underlying grammar is called ambiguous. So, uh, I mean, um, so is my screen lagging? Yes, sir, it lags. Can you uh, confirm? Okay, so let me reshare it. Let me reshare it. I, I hope it is, it's, it's fine now. Is it lagging now? Is it still lagging? Is it lagging? No, sir. Okay. It's better, sir. Okay, fine. Okay, so the question is, uh, the thing that I would like to say here that, that we have one string and we have one grammar, but that grammar for the same string allows us to have two different derivations, two different parsers, right? So these are the parsers. Whenever this thing happens, we say that the language is ambiguous. And not only that, we have one little additional thing uh, to talk about ambiguity, and that is that not just a derivation, not just two derivations or two different parsers, but we need to have uh, two leftmost derivations. So what is meant by leftmost derivation? So the leftmost derivation says that whenever you apply a rule, any rule that you want, once you apply the rule, in this rule, there could be some terminals symbol some non-terminal symbol. The non-terminal symbol are, are the variables. So whenever you would apply another rule to this derivation, it, you should always start with the variable that comes in the leftmost position, okay? So let me give you an example. Suppose you are in some derivation and it is not first step, it's not last step, it is some middle step. step. And you started with some derivation and, and suppose uh, V was your, uh, suppose S was your, starting variable, and after some steps, you reach at a point where you have some non-terminal symbol, small a, and you have a capital variable a, a and let's say cap variable b, and let's say plus c and d, right? So this a is non-terminal, uh, this a is terminal, plus is terminal, star is, is non-terminal, right? So I would mark the variables with blue. So s is a variable, 
A is a variable, B is a variable, C is a variable, D is a variable. Now, once you are at this situation, you need to apply rules further, right? Because you need to figure out the complete uh, uh, string that has to be generated. Once you are in such a situation, we say that we will go with the leftmost derivation. So what is leftmost derivation? The leftmost derivation says that the, whenever you apply a new rule, you need, to, you, you need to pick the variable A for the rule. First, you get rid of A, then whatever variables left, you would go with. So suppose there is a rule which says that A uh, substitutes epsilon. So in this case, you would have S A B plus C times D. Now, again, the leftmost derivation says that you should go with B, okay? And suppose B says that it is uh, C and E, okay? So what would happen? We would say S star A C D plus C times D. So what is the variable that you should go with, go with, uh, go for? C or D or E? You should go for E because E is the leftmost derivative. So you, so whenever you have a string in an intermediate uh, transition state, then you will you will expand the variable that comes on the leftmost position first. So this is called leftmost derivation. Now the the there could be a question that what if we do not go with the leftmost derivation? Is it okay if we go with the rightmost derivation or some intermediate uh, variable? And the answer is yes. Okay. The answer is yes, it is possible to go with any variable and the resulting derivation will not change the string. And if you if you drive a strings using this way, it will exactly drive the same kind of a string that you would drive with either leftmost or rightmost or any other way or random way. Okay, so, so this is the leftmost, not the rightmost, leftmost. Okay, so you you it, it is it is your option whether you go with leftmost or rightmost or any uh, variable that you like. It will not change the language. However, it changes the meaning in some certain way. For example, when you define and design compilers, uh, compilers are programs, right? And those programs uh, work on some underlying rules and algorithms, right? So there must be some fixed way of uh, of working with it. That's why we don't go with random and we go with the leftmost. And there are some other uh, tricks and, and things which, which are specific to the compilers. Uh, so we will go with leftmost. So we say that we call a grammar an ambiguous grammar if there exists multiple leftmost derivation for the same spec. Okay, so what is the, uh, what is the definition of ambiguity? A string is derived ambiguously in a context-free grammar G, if it has two or more different leftmost derivation. And the underlying grammar is called so right ambiguous. A string is derived If Okay, so if a string is derived ambiguously in a grammar, a string is derived ambiguously, uh, if in a CFG, it has two or more leftmost derivations, right? So if you start with a string and, and you fix the grammar, and there are 
two or more leftmost derivation or multiple deriv leftmost derivation, uh, which drive exactly the same string, then, then we say that uh, it is ambiguous derivation. And a grammar G is called ambiguous if it generates one or more strings ambiguous. Okay. So sometimes it is possible to find an um, unambiguous alternative that generate exactly the same language, but that is not ambiguous. And we have already seen the, the grammar for the expression. So rather than calling the grammar as, as E, E plus E, E times E, or E in parentheses, or A, we can say that, okay, the grammar is like this. E is a uh, term plus factor or factor and term is term times sorry. so e is e plus term or term term is term times factor or factor and factor is the expression itself in parentheses or <clears throat> or factor is E. Okay. So this is an unambiguous version of the same grammar that we have. So they generate exactly the same language, uh, but it is impossible for any string to have two leftmost derivation trees using this grammar, while we, we saw that it is possible to have for example, if you start with a plus a times a, there's only one derivation tree in this in this particular example. Okay, so it is possible to uh, whenever there is there is ambiguity, it's possible to remove ambiguity in some cases, not always. And there are some languages which are um, inherently ambiguous. Okay? For example, let's see this language L, which is uh, a, i, b, j, and c, k such that i is equal to j or j is equal to k. So this is a language that, that is over the sigma, which is sig sigma is a, b, and c. So there are only three symbols that we use. And this language consists of all those strings of a's, b's, and c's, such that all a's come before b and all b's come before c, such that the number of a's is exactly equal to number of b's or number of b's is equal to exactly equal to number of c's. Right. So what are some strings which are in this language? Uh, epsilon is there because the number of B A's is zero is exactly equal to number of A's. Epsilon is there. Then A, B is there. Uh, B, C is there. A, A, B, B is there. And B, B, C, C is there. And A, B, C is there and so on. Right. So all these strings are, are there. But the thing is that if you try to construct a grammar for this uh, particular language, uh, then it is impossible to come up with a CFG, uh, which is unambiguous. Therefore, we call it inherently ambiguous. So there are certain languages which, for which we cannot have an unambiguous grammar. Anyway, so at this point, we can take a break for 15 minutes. Uh, so let us all come back around uh, 7.50. Is that okay? Yes, sir. I will stop sharing my screen and stop recording. Okay. See you in 15 minutes. Hello, everyone. <clears throat> I hope you're all back. Okay, uh, yes, any questions so far? Sir, was this language inherently uh, ambiguous, the one you wrote? Uh, this one, this L? Yes. Yes, this L is inherently ambiguous.
Okay. Uh, if no question that we can move on with the next topic. Okay, so the next topic is push down automata. Okay, or PDA. Okay, so we studied uh, DFA, which is the deterministic finite automata in NFA, which is the non-deterministic finite automata. Uh, in DFA and NFA only recognize or accept uh, regular languages, but those machines are not capable enough to recognize context languages because they lack a very simple thing and which is they do not have enough memory, right? So, uh, so they cannot recognize this language. And we have seen some very simple languages which, which are easy for us to understand and they are very intuitive, but DFA and NFA cannot uh, recognize. But then we now know a tool uh, for CFG and uh, CFGs are our are, are tool uh, which can give us a grammar for those languages which, which are not regular sometimes, right? Um, so there's a computational model which we call push down automata. And this computational model is equivalent enough uh, that for every language for which you can have a CFG, you can construct a PDF. So for every language for which you can construct a CFG, you can also construct a push down automata. So for all the languages that, that we have seen today and some languages before, uh, for all those languages, we can construct a push down automata. And push down automata is, is, has, uh, has more computational power than DFA and, 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 and FA, and it can recognize many more languages. Okay. Uh, so we, will, we will see that how this, um, DF, uh, how this PDA can be constructed from a language and then how it utilizes in uh, recognizes some languages. Okay. And then we would have a similar results that like we had regular languages. Uh, that we say that a language is context three, if and only if the PDA is that second. So we had a similar lemma and then the theorem for regular languages, that is a language is regular if and only if there is a DFA for that, right? So we would have similar results for this one as well. Uh, so what is a PDA? A push down automata is very much like an NFA. Okay, it is very much like an NFA with additional memory, okay, in form of a stack. Okay, so it has a stack data structure attached with, with the machine and that stack can be used to recognize languages which are not regular. Okay. Okay, so a PDA is, has an NFA. So a PDA is basically an NFA with a stack. But this is just a PDA, or sometimes you write DPDA, deterministic uh, PDA. So there, there is a corresponding NPDA, which is the non-deterministic PDA, uh, but we will not discuss it today. And, and maybe later on, we will, I will just explain that what it is and not go into detail. So most of the time we would be looking at DPDA. So this DPDA, this D is with the PDA, even though there's an N in the corresponding finite automata. Okay. So it, you, you might think that it is, um, the, this is an NPDA, but that is not an NPDA. Okay. So let's, let, let us go ahead and define what is a push down automata. So a PDA is a six triple. So there are six things that we need to worry about in a, in a PDA. So we have Q, which is the set of states, sigma, which is the alphabet. Then we have another set, which we call gamma. And I will explain what is this gamma. Then we have delta as a transition function and Q0 is the starting state and F is the final state. Okay, so this Q, sigma, uh, gamma and F are all finite sets, okay? So this restriction is still there, 
then the number of states is finite, the alphabet is finite. They are not fi just finite, they're also fixed. So once you have uh, a sigma, you cannot change it. Once you have the states, you cannot change it. And gamma is also fixed and F is also fixed. Okay, so let I will explain what is this, uh, this gamma. So Q is the set of states, as is the case with NFA and DFA. Sigma is the alphabet. As is the case with the NFA, DFA, and also with CFGs and, and other things. Okay. Gamma is the stack alpha. Okay. So this uh, set contains all those symbols that we can push to the stack. All everything that can be written on the stack goes in sigma. Most of the time, this gamma contains all the symbols which are in um, uh, in, in the in the sigma, uh, but there are some sometimes additional symbols which are in gamma. Okay, the transition function is important here. The transition function delta is defined as we have to know one of the states, and we need to know what is the uh, what is the alphabet that we are reading. And we also have this epsilon that it is possible to have empty transitions. Then as a, as a result, what we do, we need to know what, is, what state the machine will be in and what will be written on the, uh, what will be written on the stack with epsilon. So we can write epsilon on, on it as well and the power set of this. Okay, so this is the transition part. Q0 is one of the states is the initial state or the starting state. And F is a set of accepting states. Okay, so these are the six things we need to define a PDA. Okay, and when we will do examples, you will see that, uh, what does it mean? Any questions so far? Okay. So let me define a language L. So let's say the language L is a language, which is zero n, one n, such that n is greater than equal to zero. And uh, we already know that for this language, we cannot construct, uh, we cannot construct a DFA or NN, right? But we can construct the CFG for that, right? So let's define a machine M, and this machine M is a PDA, so it has six things, Q, Sigma, Gamma, Delta, Q0, and F. Okay. And I would say that in this machine, we would have Q as Q1, Q2, Q3, and Q4. Let's say the starting state is Q1. Sigma is just 0, 1 because all the strings are of the value 0 and 1. Gamma is the stack variable, stack alphabet. So we would have 0 and a dollar sign. Okay, and it will become clear that why do we need uh, such symbols. The accepting state, there are two accepting states, either Q1 or Q4, and in the, in the following, I will describe the transition function delta, okay? In a tabular form, okay? In a, in a tabular form, okay? So how many states we have? Four states. We have Q1, we have Q2, we have Q3, and we have Q4. So we have to define what happens when the machine is in Q1 and reads zero, what happens when the machine is in uh, Q1 and reads one and so on. But since the underlying machine is an NFA, so we don't have just zero, we have also one and epsilon, right? Since the machine is, the underlying machine is, is NFA. Sir, okay. I have a question for this. Uh... Yes, what is the question? Uh, so the question is, okay, how did you we decide on the states the machine will be having? Will it be specified or is this something general about every machine of PDA? This is just an example. 
Okay. Okay. So this for this language, I'm creating a PDA, which will which will accept this language. So that's why I'm creating this PDA, and then I will explain that how this PDA works, and then we will start with a language and try to construct the PDA without all these steps and see that uh, what do we come up with. Okay. Since you haven't seen any example of PDA, so this is just an example. Okay. So this is the input. Right, so input could be zero, it could, input could be one, input could be epsilon. Why epsilon? Because the underlying machine is NFA. Therefore, it can have empty transitions. So input could be zero, input could be one, input could be epsilon. But there are two more things that uh, we need. Uh, there's one more thing that we need to worry about and that is tech. Because in the NFA, we would care about what is on the top of the stack with this input and that will decide what transition this this uh, this machine takes? Okay, so on. Uh, so remember, what is the what is the stack symbols? What are the stack symbols? The stack symbols are zero, in um, in in dollars. And what was the definition of the transition function? The definition of transition function says that as a result, we need to know what is the state that this machine will go, and what is the symbol that is on the stack with this epsilon as a subscript. This epsilon as a subscript tells us that it is possible that one of these symbols is on the stack. That is either zero is there or dollar is there, or it is possible the stack is empty. And the empty can be represented by an epsilon. So there are three things that we need to take care of. Zero, dollar, and epsilon. Similarly, zero, dollar, and epsilon. So zero, dollar, and epsilon, okay? Now, we will, I will only fill the cells which have some transition. For every cell which is empty here, it means that it goes to an, a trash state or an error state or some null state, okay? So I don't have anything here. So these are all empty. I don't have anything here. These are all empty. There is nothing here and there is something here which I will expect, okay? So, so rather than filling this table, so let me fill some, some entries here. When the machine is in Q1 and it does not read anything, this epsilon means that it does not read anything. And also the stack is empty. Then what does it do? It goes to state Q2, okay? Writes the dollar sign on the stack and this is the state. Okay, and I will not fill the rest of the table. I will just show you the the uh, PDA and that how it, it looks. And then we will come back and see that if it makes any sense. Okay, so my underlying machine is since there were four states. So there's this Q1, there's this Q2, so there's this Q3, and there's this Q4. And from, from the description, we know that this Q1 is the starting state. Uh, and, and it is also the accepting state, and this is accepting. Okay. When the machine is in Q1, it goes to Q2. If it does not read anything, okay, it does not read anything, it is an empty transition. And this epsilon arrow dollar. And I will explain that what does it mean. So let me write. Let me draw the full uh, PDA first, and then I will explain that. It has a self loop with zero, epsilon to zero. There is this arrow here with one, zero to epsilon. I have a self loop here, which says that one, zero, epsilon. And we have here, which says that epsilon, delta, uh, dollar, So before I explain anything in this uh, PDA, there are so many things that you might be wondering that what does, what do they mean, okay? But before we go and, before I, uh, we go and I explain all, all those things, let us come back to this description of the language once again. Okay, now try to think about a machine which is very similar to an NFA, but it also has an access to underlying stack, 
a stack is a data structure and I don't have to explain that what the stack is. So you know that there are two operations. You can either push something onto the stack or you can pop out of, or pop something out of it. So whenever you push something on the stack, it goes on the top of the stack. And whenever you pop from uh, the from the stack, whatever is, it is, is on the top of the stack comes up. So, so, <clears throat> so it's a leaf order, okay? So the last in first out kind of thing. So whatever that you insert last is the first one that will take, will be out. Now, now look at this language, L0, L is a language which consists of zero and one embedded, right? It has, uh, this language consists of all those strings which are composed of zeros and ones, such that all zeros come before all ones, and there are exactly the same number of zeros as, as the one, right? So if there are three zeros, then there must be three ones. If there are 10 zeros, there must be 10 ones, and so on and so forth. Any string which does not follow that pattern is not in this language. For example, if in any string, the number of zeros and ones are not balanced, then this is not a string in this language. If in any string, there is any one, any one that is before zero is not accepted, right? So, so only strings which are acceptable are, which, which are, which are only strings which are, are in this language are the ones which are only composed of zeros and ones, such that all zeros come before all ones and all ones come after zeros and there is no zero in between one and no one between zero. And the number of zeros is exactly number of ones, right? So we know the structure of the string. Now, if I ask you to write a function in Java, for example, that does not do any counting, that it counts, it reads, starts reading from left to right and counts at how many zeros are there, and then it counts how many ones are there, and compare at the end if the number of zeros and ones are, are same or not. Right? Rather than doing that, write a Java program that scans the input string from left to right, and each and every symbol in the string is, is, is uh, uh, is a scan, and whenever it sees a zero, it pushes that zero onto a stack. So it creates this function in Java, creates a stack, okay? So whenever it sees a zero, it pushes the zero onto this. And that's it, it doesn't do anything else. Whenever it sees a zero, it pushes the zero onto the stack, okay? And once it stops seeing zeros, once it starts seeing one, it cannot see any zero. If it sees a zero, it immediately goes to an error state and says that, no, this is an invalid input because there is a zero after I found a one, right? Now suppose the string is a, is a valid string. It's, it's a string that is in the language. So what will happen? It will scan all the zeros and for every zero, it will push that zero onto the stack. And once it, it will start reading ones, what it will do? It will start popping zeros from the stack. For every one that it reads, it pops a zero from the stack. Right. So if there are equal number of zeros in one, once it reads the last one, it will pop the last zero out of the string. Right. And once it stops reading the whole string, the entire string, there is nothing in the stack or, is, or we say that stack is empty. This empty stack represents that the input string was a valid string and it belongs to the language. And if the string ends, but the stack is not empty, it means there were more zeros than one. And if a stack becomes empty before the end of the string, it means there are more ones than zero. And at any point, if it reads a zero after it has read one, it means it is also not the string that we are looking for. This is exactly the logic which is implemented by this PDA. Okay, so, so I will, explain that what these arrows and all these uh, labels on the transition mean, but just let me know if you understand the logic that what is happening in order to recognize this line. Any question for that? So we will forget about this PDA for, for a moment and, and I will explain it. Suppose there is this string 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 that we need to uh, recognize. We know that this so belongs to L, yes. Say, can you just reiterate on the fact that how the stack, how the machine will know if we have more ones than zero? It was that is about the machine. I mean, I said okay. Yeah. Let's forget about machine for a moment. Let's okay. try to understand the logic from a job point of view of a Java or C plus plus program. And once we understand that, we will go to to the machine and we see that what's happening. Suppose this is a string, and we know that this string belongs to the language. 
And without writing the Java program, we know that there exists such a program that will do exactly what we, what we know. So what I would do is the program starts. So this is my stack. And this stack has these many uh, positions where we can insert push and pop elements, right? When the machine starts, what I would do, I would push a dollar sign onto this. This dollar sign before doing any processing means that this is the starting position of the stack, okay? And there is nothing else in, in the stack. So what I would do, I would read a zero. If I read a zero, I will push that zero onto the stack, okay? I will read the second zero. Then I will push the second zero. Then I would read the third zero. I will push the third zero onto the stack, okay? Now we would read, the machine will start reading once. Once it reads one, it will pop the zero from the stack, right? When it reads second one, it, it pops the second zero. When it reads the third one, it pops the third zero, okay? Now, once we have read the entire string, once we have read the entire string, it means that we are outside, we are outside the string. And there is an epsilon, right? It means that we, we are done with the string. So for example, the length of the string is six. So we have already scanned six characters. Now we are the seventh position on the seventh position means that we are done with the string, right? Once we are done with the string, we will go and see what is the top element on the stack. The top element on the stack is dollar. And this is exactly the symbol that we inserted or pushed in the beginning. It means that we scanned the entire string and there was no error in the between, in between. And when once we finished, we found exactly the same symbol that we initially pushed. It means that it has exactly the same number of zeros as same number as, as number of ones. So this string is a valid string in the language. Okay, is this thing clear? Now let's go and see that how it works with our PDA. Okay, with this PDA, I have few things. We have something like this. So let me write it in blue. So the transition labels are like this. We have A, <clears throat> comma B, an arrow, and C. <clears throat> what does it mean? This means it is the input. Okay, it is exactly the same kind of input that we have in our transition, uh, in NFA transitions and DFA transitions, right? So this is the input. The input that we are reading, the input from the input string that we are scanning. Then we have a comma and then B. So this B actually means that, this B means that what we are expecting on the stack, okay? What we are ex expecting on top of the stack. And this arrow and C means that what we would do, what we would do with this B with, with, which is on the top of the stack, Okay, so if we find a B on top of the stack, we would replace that B with C. Okay, so, so this means, let's, let's go to the machine and see that what happens. So this machine says epsilon, epsilon arrow dollar. It says that without reading anything, since it's an empty transition, so empty transition means that without reading anything, check what is on top of the stack. And since this is the start of the machine, there's nothing on, on top of the stack. So it, we are looking, we are expecting an epsilon. Epsilon means that it, the stack is empty. Then we say that replace it with the dollar sign. That is push this dollar sign onto the stack, okay? And move to transition, move to state number Q2. So we are done with first state and first transition. Once the machine is in Q2, it's, it only requires reading zero. If it reads a zero, it does not expect anything on to the stack. So whenever you have something like here, which says that epsilon arrow zero, it means that don't read anything from the stack, just push this symbol. So just push zero. Don't expect anything, anything on the stack. Whatever is on the stack doesn't matter. Uh, we don't care about it, but just push zero. Whenever you read a zero, push zero. Whenever you read a zero, push zero. And since it's a self loop, so it will keep reading zeros and pushing zeros as long as it, as long as there are zeros. And once it sees a one, 
once it sees a one, it expects that the top of the stack must be zero. And it says that replace that zero with epsilon. Replacing the zero with this epsilon means that just pop it out. Once you pop it out, that zero will cease to exist, right? So one of the zeros, one zero will be less in the cell, right? Then it goes to state Q3. And the state Q3 says that as long as you read zero, expect as, as long as you read one, expect a zero on top of the stack and just remove this zero, just pop it up and keep doing it as long as you read one, okay? As long as you read one. And once you are done reading with one, what you will find out, you will find the epsilon, which is at the end of the string. That is, we are done with reading the string. So what we are expecting, we are expecting that we should be looking at a dollar sign on top of the stack because we push the dollar sign on the stack in the beginning. So what we need to do, we just pop that dollar sign out and go to state, uh, state Q4. And this Q4 is an accepting state. And at this state, we do not accept any other input or anything. So this is the end. So the machine or the string is accepted if, if the input ends in Q1 or Q4. It will end in Q1 if the input string is epsilon and it will end in Q4 if the string is not epsilon, that is not empty, but a valid string in the language. If it ends up in any other state, either in Q2 or Q3, it, is, it means it is not acceptable. Now, once it is in Q3, it cannot read, it cannot read zero. If it reads zero, since there is no transition going out of Q3 with zero, so there is a transition which says that it goes to epsilon. Whenever it reads zero, it means that it, it is an error. Okay, is this thing clear? Yes, sir. Any questions? Um, sir. Yes. In Q3, uh, if we read another one, we expect a zero in the stack, right? Yes. But what if we don't see a zero in the stack? What if we see a dollar sign? Exactly. So in such case, that is also, that will also go to, so everything, so every transition that we are not showing are going to this one. So since it's an NFA, so we don't have to show all the transition, right? It's a partial function. So every transition that could exist, but it is not shown here, will go to the error state. Okay. So let, we can draw this error state here. In the middle, for example, let's draw it in red because it's error state. Okay, so all those transitions which which are not labeled, which are not shown here, will take uh, the state to this null state or empty state or error state or whatever you want to call it. Clear? Yes. Okay. So let's try to create um, a PDA for a language, which which is the language that I said is inherently ambiguous, uh, which is AI, BJ, and CK, such that such that I, J, K are all greater than or equal to zero, and I is equal to J. Or J is it, or I is equal to K. It's not the same language, it is a bit different. Okay. I is equal to J or I is equal to K, not J equal to K. So let's try to construct a PDA for that. Okay. So suppose that I ask you that how can you write a Java function that recognizes this language using a stack? How would you do that? So in this language, it says that the strings consist of A's, B's, and C's, and there could be no, so the minimum amount of A's, B's, and C's is zero. So there could be zero A, zero B, zero C, uh, but it could be anything, right? Uh, the second condition says that the number of A's is exactly number of B's, <clears throat> or number of A's is exactly equal to number of C's. 
So we need to scan. So for example, if there's a string that is not empty string, let's imagine it contains some A's and some B's and some C's. Once you are reading A's, since it is the first character, so you don't expect anything, right? So you say that there are A's. So, so there are two possibilities. Either the number of A's, either the number of A's is equal to number of B's or number of A's is ex exactly equal to number of C's, right? So we can say that there are two possibilities. So we can define a non-deterministic machine here. So the underlying NFA, underlying finite automata is a non-deterministic. So we say that there, are, there might be two branches. The first branch will assume, the first branch will assume that the number of A's is exactly number of B's and doesn't matter how many C's we need. And the second branch will assume that the number of A's is exactly number of C's and we don't care about number of C's, right? So there could be two branches. So whenever there is input, whenever there is input, and suppose this is the machine that we are looking at, there are two possibilities. Either the number of A's is same as number of B's, or number of A's is same as number of C's, right? It is possible that both of these things happen at the same time, uh, but we don't have to worry about it because if, if both of things happen, it means that both of them must be true, right? So if one of them is true, then it means that both of them are, are true. This is also captured. So if you can just check this one or this one, then we are done. So we, it means that in our machine, there would be two branches. First branch will be responsible for checking this condition. And the second branch will be responsible for checking this condition. And how do we decide that which branch to follow? We don't have to decide because the underlying machine is, 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 is non-deterministic. That is the underlying finite automata is non-deterministic. So we can always take an empty transition from a, trans, from a state and we can do both the branches, right? So we will do exactly the same thing. So we would say that there is a state Q1. In this state Q1, we don't do much. It's the first state, which what, what it does is it reads nothing. It expects nothing on the stack and it just push the, pushes the dollar sign onto the stack. Then we go to state Q2. In the state Q2, we read A's and we don't expect anything onto the stack and we just push the A onto the stack. And over here, once we are done with reading A, so we can take an empty transition. We don't expect anything onto the stack and we just, we don't do anything with the stack. We don't read any input. We don't expect anything on the stack. We don't do anything on the stack, right? So we don't push, we don't pop. We go to state number Q3. And in Q3, we read B's. And this branch is responsible for checking the number of A's is exactly number of B's, the first branch. So for every B we read, we assume there is an A on the stack and we just remove this stack. We just remove this A. So if the number of A's is exactly the number of B's, we don't care how many C's we have, right? So in this state, since uh, it is possible uh, that, that we either end up the string or there are some C's. So we take an empty transition. And since we already have uh, popped out all A's, so now we expect a dollar sign on top of the stack. In that case, we don't, we just pop it out. We go to Q4 and over here, we just read C and we don't care what is on the stack and we don't do anything with the stack. And this is accepting state. Okay. So this branch is this branch. So if I call this branch, uh, branch A, so this is the branch A. This thing is the branch A. We also need to talk about branch B. So let's talk about branch B. So for, for the branch B, what we do, we can, since Q2 is the first state after Q1, because Q1 is, is necessary. So we take an empty transition here and we say that we, we already have read A's, now we will read B's, okay? But B's are to be ignored because in this branch, we will only check the number of A's with number of C's. So whatever number of B's you read, you just ignore it. So there's a self loop of reading B's and we just ignore it. 
Then we take an empty transition. We don't expect anything on, on, on the stack and we don't do anything with the stack. Let's call it Q5, we go to Q6. In this state, it is important to read number of Cs and these number of Cs must be equal to number of A's. So for every C that we read, we expect an A on top of the stack and we just pop it out. And once we pop it out, the either the string, uh, either, either so this means that the since C is the last possible character. So it means that the string must end. So we the input is empty and we must see a dollar sign on, on top of the stack. We just pop it out and we go to a state Q7 and this Q7 must be. And this PDA, let's call it M, accepts the language. So we say that if, if it is equal to M, not M. L, then L of M is equal to L. Is this thing clear? And this is the second branch. Is this thing clear? Okay, I think we should stop here, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Uh, regarding the online classes, uh, I was not feeling well in the afternoon, so I could not come to the campus. Um, and I will see that if I can, if I could come to campus on Saturday's class, uh, but most probably I will not come to campus on Saturday as well. <clears throat> but from next week onwards, I will try my best to be on campus as many times as possible. So Tuesday's class would be on campus, but uh, Saturday's class would not be on campus. Okay, so sorry for the situation because uh, for me, uh, I mean, uh, I like teaching in, inside a classroom if everyone is, is present over there, um, but teaching in a hybrid fashion is a little bit difficult. Uh, so I will figure it out that if it is possible to use board in such a way that we can capture it rather than writing on, uh, on this tablet, uh, then we will figure it out. If it is not possible, then we will keep working with the way that we have uh, conducted the classes last week. Okay, so sorry for this situation. So I will try my best that we can conduct these classes in in hybrid fashion. Okay, with this I will stop. And if you have any questions, just let me know. Otherwise, uh, I would say thank you Sir, very much. There is one question. Yes, please. Sir, uh, in the previous <clears throat> in this uh, period that you made uh, the transition yes. from Q two to Q five. Uh, there is an uh, empty transition, right? So, so stack key care situation. Okay, we, we will will we be expecting a, an empty transition as well? Uh, we don't care about what is on top of the stack. Okay, we so don't be care like, what uh, is, and we don't do anything with the stack. Okay, it's it is very similar to the transition that we have made. Okay. Thank you. Sir. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Take care for the office and see you on Saturday.